Well, the first thing I should do is probably apologize for my protracted absence. You may or may not notice that I have a somewhat hoarse voice. And what happened was I went on vacation for a week, came back, and shortly thereafter ended up with strep throat. And finally, I'm somewhat in a condition to make videos again. And so here's the first one, and I decided to keep it simple just because I didn't have too much time to do it before the weekend, which is when I usually publish videos. So this is a continuation of viewer questions, and it's in fact a continuation of the first one, which had a question from Bjorn from Belgium. And the second part of his question concerned what happens when you take two transformers and connect them back to back. Well, that's what this video is about, and let's see what happens. So, for back-to-back -back transformers, we're really thinking about something like this, where this is the primary of the input transformer, and then this is the secondary of that transformer, and ours actually has a little tap there, so even though its output is supposed to be 12 volts, in fact, it's about 15 volts, and the tap would be at 7.5, and, and our input is 120 volts over here. And in the back-to-back -back configuration, well, we'll just have an identical transformer over here, like this. And if we were to connect these things together, what we would expect is, well, we'll supply 120 volts, we'll get 15 volts across here, and we should get close to 120 volts on the output over here. And the question really is, are there any special or tricky things we need to know when connecting these transformers together like this for whatever reason? And I believe Bjorn's thought was he wanted to use this sort of configuration to provide a certain amount of isolation. Well, the best thing to do is to try it. So we'll actually use this transformer and this transformer to investigate what's going on. And the first thing we need to do is set up some power. And the way we're going to do that is we will connect our 120 volts to one of these nice gizmos over here. And that is the little British quick test device. And I've just added some wires so that we can attach some alligator clips to it. And we'll also use this voltmeter so we can see what's going on and maybe we'll use a knife to hold it in position so the reflection does not cover the screen and going from the voltmeter which i've turned into a milliammeter we will use a clip to get the neutral from the AC power. Funny how much harder it is when you're videoing it. And that neutral goes through the ammeter and will connect to the neutral on the primary of the transformer like that. There we go. And I should point out that all of this is on a GFCI device for protection, but we have to be aware that when we create 120 volts out this end of the transformer, it's not attached to any GFCI device. So if I were to do something stupid like touch both terminals of the transformer, I could get a very bad electrical shock. So I will try not to do that. All right, so there's our milliammeter showing nothing right now as it should and if we close the quick test 
what do we see? There we go. We see around 31 milliamps is flowing into this transformer. And your first thought might be, well, that's kind of strange because it's not connected to anything, so it should be drawing no current. Well, what it's doing is the 120 volts on the primary is acting like an inductor and that inductor has a certain reactance which is the complex form of resistance and what that means is a certain current will flow through that inductance and it's that inductance that creates the AC field in the core of the transformer so we call that magnetizing current so we have about 30 milliamps of magnetizing current well that's not actually completely true. That magnetizing current is 90 degrees delayed behind the voltage. That's typical of an inductor. And what that means is there's no power actually flowing into the inductor as a result of that current. Because if you want, during the first bit of the cycle, the power goes into the inductor. And because it's out of phase during the second half, it goes right back out into the grid. So some of this current is that magnetizing current, but because we don't have any superconductors in here and because there's energy losses in the core, a certain amount of that current is not out of phase. It is if you want a real component of the current and it's delivering power to this transformer. And the power it's delivering is the power that's being lost in the primary coil and the core just because things are not perfect. Well, we can see what that power is by looking at the little power meter that I have the quick test plugged into. And well, it looks like this transformer is consuming about 1.4 watts when it isn't doing anything at all. And given that it's somewhere around a 15 watt transformer or so, well, that gives us a sense of how efficient this transformer is going to be under full load. And of course, right now under zero load, it is 0% efficient. All right. Well, that's very interesting, but that hasn't really answered the question, what happens when you connect these things together? We will connect the secondary of this transformer to the low voltage winding of the second transformer. So even though this is a low voltage winding here, it's in a sense the primary of the second transformer. And we'll do the same thing with the other end of the winding. In other words, we're completing this circuit over here. And watch what happens to the current. It almost doubled. Why would that be? Well, it's because of this transformer needs the same amount of magnetizing current and for that matter will have about the same amount of power losses as the original one so we would expect that current to double now if we do look at our power meter we can also see that the power going into this combined system has just about doubled but you might be wondering what's the current through these wires here on the low voltage side. If we had about 30 milliamps going into this transformer when it wasn't connected to anything else, we would expect this transformer to be drawing in about the same amount of real and reactive power. But because this voltage is only 15 volts, compared to the 120 volts across the primary, we would expect that instead of 30 milliamps being consumed by the transformer here, going in from the low voltage side, we would have perhaps a little less than 10 times that. If we had exactly 12 volts here, it would be 10 times that, 15. Well, maybe I'd say it's eight or nine times the 30 milliamps, so somewhere in the quarter amp range flowing through these two wires just to energize this transformer. And so what we'll do is use this nice little ammeter 
clip-on ammeter and see if we can measure what the current going into the second transformer is. And there we go. About 0.265 amps. That's almost exactly what we predicted. And all that really means is we are now energizing this transformer or magnetizing it in the same way we're magnetizing that one. But all of that magnetizing current has to come from the first transformer. So we're basically, again, having about a quarter of an amp or so flow through our secondary wires, secondary here, primary here. So what does the fact that we're drawing in about a quarter of an amp through these things mean? Well, it means that as far as this transformer is concerned, even when we're delivering no power to the load way down here, the 120 volt load at the isolated end of our system, we're already consuming about a quarter of an amp on its output well, the output coil is rated at 1.2 amps for this transformer over here. So, in fact, all we have is about 0.95 amps left, or about, well, somewhere around 1 amp, we can say. So, the amount of power that we can provide to this transformer is just a bit less by, well, 0.25 over 1.25, so it's somewhere around the 75 to 80 percent of the maximum power we could have gotten directly from here. So that's really the issue that every time we add a transformer in the chain, what we're having to do is not only supply the current that we want for our eventual load over here, but also the current to magnetize the second transformer. And that uses up some of the available current from the first transformer. So if we had a whole chain of these, what it would mean is we would have less and less available current for our final load at the final 120 volt terminals because a considerable part of the allowable current is being consumed to magnetize each of the cores. And I should point out, since I haven't in this video, that the limitations for transformers is typically a current rating of each of the windings as opposed to a total power rating even though when you combine the voltage with the current you do get a total power it's the current rating of the windings that's the limiting factor now bjorn did say he did want to use this for isolation purposes and you can certainly do that but it does mean you have to be a little bit careful as to the characteristics of these transformers. In other words, how well are these two windings isolated from each other? And if you're doing it from the perspective of human safety, well, is there enough of a insulation between primary and secondary to indeed make it as safe as you'd like it to be? And there really should be on a 120 volt to 12 volt transformer because typically the 12 volt side may be accessible to humans in one way or the other, but it's still something you have to check and be very conscious of. Well, that's all good and well, but one of your questions might be, what could we do to perhaps alleviate the extra current that this transformer is drawing from that transformer simply to energize its coil? And we actually can do something about it. And I have here a 47 microfarad capacitor and the interesting thing about a capacitor is while an inductor as in the coils around the cores of the transformer will draw a lagging current a current that lags the voltage applied to the coil a capacitor will draw a leading current a current that precedes the voltage to the coil. In other words, it does exactly the opposite. And if these currents through magnetics lag by 90 degrees, these currents through capacitors lead by 90 degrees. They're 180 degrees out of phase, and they should cancel. So 
if I put this capacitor across the terminals of the transformer, if I'm not lying to you, the amount of current that we see going in should drop because we should be reducing the amount of current that's being drawn from these two wires over here. So let's try it. There's one, and here's the other. Oh, it works better when it stays stuck on. Here we go. And you can see we've dropped the current by somewhere around 22 milliamps or something in that range. We can even demonstrate that with our clamp on ammeter. 0.18 amps. If I disconnect the capacitor, the current flowing through here now goes up to 0.224 amps. So indeed, by attaching the capacitor, we get the leading current to cancel some of the lagging current and reduce the total current going into the system, or for that matter, the current coming out of the first transformer. So that will somewhat alleviate the problem, but not completely. We can't make this second current completely go away because no matter what we do in terms of trying to cancel out the inductive current of this transformer, there will always need to be some real current to supply the power losses in there. And indeed, it turns out that the capacitor I've selected is about right to largely get rid of the inductive current, but still leaves the real current carrying the loss power to this transformer. And, well, that's essentially what happens. If you're interested in going a little bit deeper into what happens when you have a whole series of transformers connected together like that, well, in a previous video, and in fact, one of my favorite videos, I created what I've called an electromagnetic chain. And what it essentially is, is a series of toroid or donut-shaped transformers connected together with a thick toroid or donut of copper pipe. In other words, one-turn coils that could be primary or secondary. And we indeed investigated how the magnetizing current increases as you move along the chain, as well as a whole bunch of other interesting effects when you have a series of transformers like that. So, so the link to that video should be floating around somewhere up in the corner of the screen. And I'll also have it in the description of the video below. Well, I hope you found that useful and interesting. And if you do get a chance, take a look at the electromagnetic chain video. There should be a box somewhere up here showing a link to it. And if you have any further questions you would like me to address pertaining to virtually anything that might be remotely covered by things I do in this channel, please add them to the questions below or send me an email. And see you next time.